Uh, I'd rather give you some uh, sort of a framework to uh, uh, try and understand what's going on, but particularly what's going on from the American perspective. So I want to sort of talk about American foreign policy as it relates to uh, what's going on in the Arab world. And uh, in order to do that, let's see. Go ahead. Ah, whoops. Okay. All right. There we go. Um, these are some just some scenes uh, from the different countries, and we'll, I'll talk about those uh, uh, fairly briefly. But uh, what I want to do first is I want to give you a, a sort of a framework for looking at American foreign policy. American foreign policy, from the, really from the time of the founding of the United States in the 18th century, um, has, has a, there's been a tension between what we call realism and idealism, between a foreign policy that stresses our interests as a country, what is in the best interest of the United States, and uh, a foreign policy that stresses our values. What, what, what is really, should we be consistent with our values about democracy and human rights? And very often, our values and our interests uh, clash. And there's always been a tension between values and interests in American foreign policy. And I want to give you a little bit of, uh, of realism and idealism from sort of a political science perspective. And then we'll look at how that applies to uh, what, what we're doing in the Middle East. Um, so uh, first of all, uh, can you hear me? All right, well, one of, the, one of the founders of uh, modern realism in political science is a guy named Hans Morgenthau. And um, he said that states can make an act in terms of interest defined as power. From a realist perspective in foreign policy, all states are concerned with their own interests. And the way you maintain your interests, the way you pursue your interests, is by achieving and maintaining and enhancing your power. And power is usually measured in terms of your military power. All right? um, so the Russians, the Chinese, the Americans, the British, the French, um, from this perspective, everybody, all countries uh, are doing what's in their own national self-interest. And very often what's in your self-interest um, is not necessarily consistent with what you might believe in. Right? Um, if, if a, from a realist perspective, it's military strength what we call hard power. Right? Um, now, realism uh, sometimes can come off as being a bit, a bit cynical. Um, so for example, uh, in, in, during the Cold War, uh, when we were fighting against the, the Soviet Union, we were trying to contain communism and the spread of communism. The United States very often would support uh, repressive, non-democratic regimes because they were anti-communist. And our, our, our interest was holding communism at bay, not necessarily promoting democracy, okay? Because if we had a democratic election and say communist or socialist came to power, that wouldn't necessarily be in our interest. So in the United States, we actually, you know, in the 1960s, 1970s, and the 50s on actually, the US uh, uh, sometimes would actually overthrow governments that were seen Against, against the United States, even if they were democratic. So Chile in 1973, Guatemala in 1954, um, Iran in 1953, we overthrew a democratically elected prime minister because he was uh, taking policy towards oil that we didn't like. The British and the CIA got together and did that. Um, the more cynical side of realism is captured by this famous saying from Franklin Roosevelt in the 1930s, before the Cold War, talking about a Latin American dictator. He said, you know, the guy, he may be an SOB, but at least he's our SOB. Um, that it, you know, he's not a nice guy, but he's doing what we want him to do. That is sort of cynical realism at its, at its uh, most part of work. Okay. Um, <coughs> as I said, in, in, um, during the Cold War, uh, the U.S. had a policy called ABC, any, anything but communist. And so we would basically support, if, if they were democratic, so much the better. But in a lot of places in the, the developing world, we supported them that weren't. And again, that, that's a really good case of pursuing our interests uh, that might actually clash with our values. Um, and there's a big debate as well, you know, in the long term, is that really a good idea? So in the case of Egypt, as you've been, if you've been following, you know, the United States supported uh, Hosni Mubarak, the, the strong man in Egypt for 30 years. Hosni Mubarak was a very, very pro-American um, dictator. He did a lot of things that we wanted him to do, all right? But in the long run, it wasn't really in our interest to have been supporting him all these years, given how he was overthrown and, and the turmoil. And that's a big question that people who look at foreign policy uh, debate. Uh, in the Middle East, uh, over time, uh, the United States has, uh, has supported a lot of repressive non-democratic regimes in the Arab world. Um, Egypt, Saudi Arabia are a good example. Um, and this is really in the name of maintaining stability. Um, it wasn't really holding out communism so much, although in the Cold War we were concerned about that. But really the idea was, you know, the Middle East is a very volatile area. Um, we're concerned about Israel's security. We're concerned about the flow of oil from the Persian Gulf. And those types of things were more important than necessarily having uh, democratic governments that might not pursue policies that we like. So Saudi Arabia is a very good example of, of realism, the way we deal with Saudi Arabia. <coughs> Saudi Arabia has one of the most repressive human rights records in the world. Um, they're, they're, they, uh, they repress uh, religious minorities, the, the Shiites. 
Uh, they repress women. Uh, they torture people. They allow no democracy whatsoever, no dissent whatsoever. Um, however, uh, they, ha they have the largest crude oil reserves in the world. Um, if, with sanctions on Iran, if Iran starts shutting off oil, the Saudis are, are offering to increase the oil flow, so it'll be better for us. So we sort of hold our tongue. We bite our tongue. We don't actually say a lot to the Saudis um, the way we wouldn't say other things. <coughs> we don't want to ruin that relationship. So this is a really good case of our interests uh, trumping our values. Right. Um, now, from a realist perspective, according to realists, uh, the state should avoid, states being country, should avoid issues, crises, conflicts that, that are not directly in their interest. That means you don't get into humanitarian interventions. You don't go in uh, from a realist perspective when there was a genocide in Rwanda, um, as, as a, a famous person said, we don't have a dog in that fight. Uh, it's, not, it's not our concern. Yes, it's absolutely horrible that 800,000 people were killed in a matter of 100 days, all right? But from a realist perspective, did that really impact on American foreign policy? Sadly, no, it didn't, all right? Um, and so from a pure realist, they were saying, should we actually get sucked into, well, sort of maybe a civil war? We don't want to get sucked into something like that. So I'm giving I'm doing this fairly quickly, but I want to give you the sense. Okay, realism is a very, very uh, important way of looking at foreign policy. It leads to rational choice theory, all sorts of other kinds of things that are studied in political science by historians as well. And the other end of the spectrum is idealism. So rather than focusing on your interests, you're focusing on your values. Okay? And American idealism really comes out of something that we call American exceptionalism. And American exceptionalism is a set of arguments going back to the time of the Pilgrims. Right, the idea of a, of a city on a hill, the new Zion, things like this, that, there, that there's something unique about America. That America uh, stands for certain types of values, that America was, a, uh, was born free, as Tocqueville said, setting aside the fact that we were also uh, a republic of slavery, um, which is a pretty, pretty big uh, lunch there. Um, but, but compared to European countries, there was, there was more freedom, um, there was religious liberty, things like this. Um, and from the very beginning, uh, Americans also believe that we have certain sets of values that make us unique. And out of this American exceptionalism comes this idea of, of American idealism, right? And the, the most famous American president who sort of is, uh, we associate with American idealism was Woodrow Wilson. <coughs> World War I, the United States reluctantly gets into World War I, and his famous saying was, we're, we're going into the war to make the world safe for democracy, all right? That is very much from an idealist perspective. The idea that people should be free, and colonialism, these kinds of things, was it necessarily in our interests? Maybe not. But what Woodrow Wilson was saying was we have to pursue our values. America stands for something special, and we have to do this. Right? Um, so foreign policy from this perspective is rather than focusing on power, we should be focusing on morality. Rather than interests, values. All right? um, and one of, the, one of the same things from this is this idea that in the long run, rather than saying might makes for right, in the long run, right makes for right. Right makes for might. If you're doing the right thing, you will be stronger because of it. And more people will respect you because of it. Um, power it, it, uh, gets people to fear you. But if you're doing the right thing, if you're acting morally, if you're following your values, people will follow you because they want to. And that actually can be more powerful in the long run than because they fear you. And so a uh, famous uh, political scientist by the name of Joseph Nye uh, coined the term soft power. You might actually hear this if they talk about it on the news sometimes, right? And soft power is the ability to entice the tracks based on values. And he said, if the United States represents values that others want to follow, it will cost us less to leave. So the idea is that what, what, what idealists are saying is that really in the long run, pursuing your values actually can even get your interests uh, better in the long run because people will want, will, will want to follow you, they will respect you. Right? Um, and then, um, for those of you who are interested in what we talk about later, you want, um, the, the, after 9 11, the of the Bush Doctrine, going into the Iraq, going into Iraq um, as, a, as sort of a war for regime change. That was really in line with idealism, not with realism. A lot of realists, including the Republican Party, were very much opposed to the Iraq War because they said, this is not in our interest. We can contain or we can contain Saddam. The idea of going to war to transform a country to make it a better place, that's idealism. That's not realism. Right? Um, and I would call it a muscular, I will say, You're using force in the name of, of the good. Okay, and dividing the world into good and evil. Realists would say you never do that. All countries have interests. You don't, you don't rank them by being good or evil. Right? Whereas someone who focuses on idealism would uh, rank them by being good or evil. All right. Um, there are limitations of this. <coughs> idealism, well, first of all, idealism can come off as, as being a hubristic, um, a self-righteous, arrogant. This idea that you know, we, we, we have a set of values. Our values are better than yours. We're going to impose our values on you. And there's a lot of resistance to that. Right? 
beyond that, realists would tell idealists you're naive about the world because realists get the term from realism. This is the way the world really operates. The real world is that countries operate out of their own self-interest, right? And with realism stop, I mean, excuse me, with, with, a, with a soft power and idealism stop uh, Assad from killing his own people in Syria? Or is he going to take military force? That's what a realist would ask, right? Would soft power have stopped Hitler? Probably not. And so realists would say, look, to idealists, you know what? You're, you're naive about the way the world really operates. On the other hand, realism itself has some down, downsides as well. <clears throat> if you were following um, what happened a few weeks ago in, in the UN Security Council, there was a resolution to condemn Syria, and Russia and China both vetoed it, which means it stopped. It stopped in its tracks. Russia did, um, it, because frankly, uh, it's in their interest to support the Syrian government. Um, so they, sell all their, they sell weapons to Syria. Syria provides them with access to a naval base. Um, Russia wants to contain the United States. They don't want the United States having more power in the Middle East. Did the Russians care about the fact that over 7,000 civilians have been murdered by the regime? No. Um, and, and neither, frankly, did the Chinese. They were out, operating out of their own rational self-interest, uh, from a realist perspective. That comes off as being very cynical, all right? And there's a downside to that. Russia and China now are sort of backing up a little because the international reaction was so strong and, 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 and so condemnatory to these, to these countries. How can you possibly veto these resolutions when people are literally being, uh, when Syrian tanks are firing into apartment buildings? And you're saying nothing should be done? You're not willing to condemn them for doing this? And, and, and there's, 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 uh, so it comes out to be cynical. And as I say here, particularly for the, Ameri the United States, because we do make this claim for being exceptional. We do make this claim for being um, uh, democratic and, and, and standing for human rights. You don't see the Russians or the Chinese making those claims. <coughs> but when we, when we have a foreign policy that says, hey, you might be RSOB, so it's okay, that is not something that you can really hang your hat on. You know, it, it really raises some questions about, are we comfortable with that? And it makes us uneasy. It makes Americans, and it makes presidents of the United States, Democrats and Republicans, uneasy to uh, not say to the Saudis uh, what we'd like to say to them because we need their oil, right? And, and so there, there, are, there are downsides to both of these. Again, uh, it is not a question of uh, does, does the United States choose one over the other. American foreign policy has always been an admixture of the two. They exist in tension. Sometimes we stress realism more than idealism. Sometimes it's the other way around. Sometimes in one particular part of the world we're stressing realism more than, than, than elsewhere. Um, this is sort of a conceptual framework I want you to have in your mind as, you, as we move forward. As you're following these events that go on, and look at, at American, how America behaves and what America does in other parts of the world, not just the Middle East. Okay. All right. So let's get on to the actual um, Middle East. Yeah. All right. So this is Middle East and North Africa. Well, we have seen um, the Arab, what's called the Arab Spring or the Arab Awakening is a series of, of spontaneous uprisings that, that's challenged non-democratic non governments um, in North Africa, in Tunisia, in Libya, in Egypt, in Syria, uh, in Bahrain, in Yemen. And it's literally spread from North Africa all the way to the Persian Gulf, all right, and, and to the bottom of the Arabian Peninsula. The entire Arab world uh, is being challenged by this. In countries where there are no actual mass uprisings, they're still being challenged. They have to do with Morocco, uh, uh, Jordan, are also being challenged as well. Um, just to give you a sense of, of, of the importance of this map up here. This is the Persian Gulf, right? Here's Iran, here's Saudi Arabia, Bahrain is here. Um, this is the, uh, the Straits of Hormuz, which you might be hearing about. Um, the Iranians are threatening to block, blockade the Straits of Hormuz uh, if, uh, if there's a war or even if the sanctions against them get tougher because of the nuclear uh, project. Um, about uh, 65 to 70% of the Persian Gulf oil flows through the uh, oil is in the Middle East flows through the Middle East. Um, if the Persian Gulf is blockaded, uh, if it's stopped, uh, we can see uh, the price of gasoline shoot up by maybe two or three dollars more a gallon. Right? I mean, if, if you really, if a war starts with Iran, you can see five to five dollars, five dollar gallon gasoline. Right? Um, now, in Bahrain, so I'm going to talk about this for a minute. Uh, in, in a few minutes, Bahrain is a tiny little, uh, very tiny little country. It also happens to be the headquarters for the U.S. Fifth Fleet which is the, the, Navy, the Navy fleet that patrols the Persian Gulf. This is the, the fifth fleet is the way we project our power into the Persian Gulf, right? Very important. We also launch a lot of, uh, of uh, uh, missions from the, from the fifth fleet aircraft carriers uh, into Iraq and also into Afghanistan, right? So, it's a, so the Bahrain is strategically critical to the United States. Um, and you'll see that it's also literally between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Saudi Arabia and Iran are, are intense uh, rivals uh, geopolitically. Also, uh, different in terms of Sunni versus Islam, a lot of different things. So Bahrain is right in the middle of it. 
and we're seeing sort of the Cold War that's developing between Saudi Arabia and Iran, and we're obviously on the side of Saudi Arabia. We need Saudi Arabia, not just for the oil, but we need Saudi Arabia to help contain Iran, because we're concerned about Iran. So these are all part of like the, the, sort of like the, the, the checkerboard, the chessboard of geopolitics. That we're about. All right. We just go through this uh, fairly quickly, uh, and then we can um, talk about uh, Uh, Egypt, uh, you know, Mubarak was overthrown over a year ago. Um, 